Hi class, welcome to the screencast on non-Mendelian genetics. So, so far we have really only looked at some pretty basic traits that Mendel studied. Remember those either or characteristics that were very easy to follow. But since Mendel, scientists have learned a lot about genetics and we have found that not all inheritance patterns are quite so simple to follow. So during this video we're going to learn about a couple different ways that um, traits can be inherited, including how blood types are inherited, and how certain types of flower color are inherited. So before we get into uh, those patterns, I want to talk about three levels of dominance that we see in genetics. The first level of dominance you've already seen and you're already familiar with is the very simple dominant recessive alleles. So purple is dominant to white. It's that either or scenario. So you're already familiar with that. But there are two that we're not quite familiar with. Incomplete dominance is the second one. Incomplete dominance is where the heterozygote has a different phenotype than either parent, which is different than the simple dominant recessive. I like to think of this as the blending uh, theory, sort of. So we have a red homozygous dominant, a white homozygous recessive. When we cross them, we blend those phenotypes to produce a new phenotype in the heterozygote, which is pink. And the last one is something called codominance. So this is totally different. Now, both alleles are showing in the phenotype, again, of just the heterozygote. So you have a homozygous dominant red, a homozygous recessive white, and then in the heterozygote, you see both red and white spots. Both of them show up. So we're gonna do examples with these last two. So here's our first example. Remember that heterozygotes have this intermediate blended phenotype of the two homozygotes. So we have four o'clock plants that show incomplete dominance, and homozygotes are red or white, while heterozygotes are pink. So I'm gonna do the cross with you between a red flower and a white flower. So I'm just gonna put the red flower on top, so there's my red flower. We're just gonna do a basic Punnett square, and I'm crossing it with a white flower. Now notice, I'm using both capital letters, and I'm using two different capital letters. This is a new notation for incomplete dominance that you will have to use. And we always do put the dominant letter first. So all the offspring, the genotype of all the offspring are going to be big R, big W, but the phenotype of all the offspring are going to be pink. So again, write that down. Genotype are all RW, phenotype they are all pink. So again, notice the new notation. No small letters, only two different capital letters for incomplete dominance. So not too hard. I'm going to have you do this next one on your own in your notes, so read through this. So I'm going to have you do this one on your own, remembering that the heterozygote has an intermediate phenotype, and its genotype is going to have those two different letters, those two different alleles. So at the end, write out the genotype and the phenotype ratios of the offspring of this cross. Okay, the third one was this codominance. So I'm going to do some examples with you. Remember, both colors are showing at the same time, so both red and both white. So here's the example we'll do together. We've got cattle. This is a classic example of codominance. So the roan color, maybe you've heard of a roan coat before, this is where you see both red and white hairs together on that cow. So they can be red with both big R's. Notice the new notation again. With codominance, we use this big C, and then we use a superscript for the color. So they can be red, they can be white, or they can be roan, where that, in, that heterozygote is, in, is that both showing. So predict the phenotype ratios of the offspring when we've got a homozygous white cow is crossed with a roan bull. Okay, so up top I'm going to go ahead and put up my white, and then on the left here I'm going to put my roan. So again, it's the big C with the superscripts. So that is the cross. And when we finish filling in the Punnett square, we see that in the end, half of the offspring are going to be roan. So all of these are roan and all of these are white. Again, just, and again, just notice the big thing with codominance is this new notation. Um, so just remember that when you're doing this next example on your own with flower color. Again, give the genotype and phenotype ratios of the offspring in your notes. Okay, another example of codominance is actually displayed by uh, human blood groups. So I'm just going to just talk a little bit about how this happens and then we'll do examples. So this is also called multiple alleles or codominance because there are actually more than two alleles when we talk about blood groups. There are three, and again, new notation. So big I A, big I B, and little i. These are the three alleles that are possible. Now you're always going to have only two of those alleles in your genotype, but there are three possibilities. So here are the possible genotypes and phenotypes. 
genotypes. Please write this chart in your notes, memorize this chart. So the genotype for type A blood are these two possibilities. This little I is just sort of like a, an O. It, it doesn't really do anything. It doesn't add anything. Uh, type B, you could have these two genotypes. Type AB, you are only this genotype. And type O, you are only this genotype. So again, remember, this is the genetic makeup. makeup. This is the genotypes. And then over here, the blood type, this is the phenotype, which you actually see. So let's do an example. State the predicted blood types of the offspring between a cross of a type A heterozygote and a type O male. So let's go ahead and put the male up top. He's little i, little i. We know that simply because we have memorized that chart. So we know all the genotypes and phenotypes for blood groups. Now it's a heterozygous female, so we've got that allele, but the other allele is different because she's a heterozygote, so she's the little i. So let's go ahead and fill this in fill it in just like any other pen and square and we see that half the offspring are going to have type A blood with that genotype and the other half are going to have type O blood with that genotype. Okay, go ahead and do this example on your own in your notes and show me the pen and square. And now we're going to talk about blood groups again about universal donors and receivers or recipients um, because this is very often talked about in a biology course. So go ahead and copy this uh, chart in your notes. It's a great chart to understand. So what we have here are the different red blood, blood cell types, types that exist in humans. So if you have uh, a type A allele, your blood cells are going to have this little um, a sort of marker on the red blood cells. And your antibodies, your immune system, is going to want to fight these B markers. So it'll be anti-B. So if you're type A and you see type B, you're going to want to fight it because it's not like yourself. Same goes, but with reverse for group B or type B. You've got the B marker, therefore you have anti-A antibodies. You are going to fight any A markers that you see because they're not like you. Okay, group AB, now you're kind of nice because you have both markers, therefore you don't see anything as foreign, you don't attack anything, you don't have anybody, any antibodies in your plasma. And group O is the opposite of AB. You have no markers, you have no A or B marker, therefore you have anti-A and anti-B. You see both of those as foreign and you're going to attack both of those. Therefore, if you, if you want to try to guess on your own which one's the universal donor and the universal receiver, go ahead and do that. So what we know is that group O is the universal donor because it's not going to have any foreign markers on the blood cells. No recipient is going to see that and want to reject it because there are no markers. Likewise, group AB is the universal receiver because it doesn't see anything as foreign. It doesn't attack anything. It will see A and like it. It will see B and it will also like it. It'll see AB and like it. It'll see O and like it. So make sure you have this written down in your notes. You understand it and we'll talk about it in class. There's one final non-Mendelian pattern of inheritance that's probably the most difficult to work with, and it's called sex-linked inheritance. So, so far, we've only been talking about alleles that are on our autosomes. Remember, those are chromosomes 1 through 22. But there are some alleles and genes that are on our actual sex chromosomes, our X's and our Y's. So let's take a look at our actual sex chromosomes. This is the X chromosome. Notice that it's much, much bigger than the Y chromosome. Therefore, it contains a lot of genetic material. The Y chromosome is so tiny, it contains only a few genes. And one of the, really the only important gene on there is the SRY gene, SRY, the sex determining gene. And that's going to help the male produce those male secondary sexual characteristics. Um, so that's gonna be important to keep in mind for this next slide. So if you're a male, uh, your genetic makeup is XY, and if you're a female, your genetic makeup is XX. Now there are two common diseases that we talk about with sex-linked inheritance, and that is hemophilia, which is recessive, and color blindness, which is also recessive. Now the key thing here, remember, is that the X chromosome contains a lot of genetic material, and the Y chromosome doesn't. So let's take hemophilia, for example. If we have a female who's a carrier for hemophilia, she is big H, little h, because she's a carrier. Let's say that we have a male who does not have hemophilia, so he is only big H. We don't put anything on the Y. We don't put anything on the Y. If he had hemophilia, he would be big X, little h, and then Y. We don't put anything on the Y, because it's small and there's no genetic material there. Okay, so let's do an example. So we've got predict the phenotypes of the offspring between a woman who is a carrier for hemophilia and a man who does not have hemophilia. 
So I just showed you that genotype, so she's a heterozygote. And then we're going to put the male over here on the left. He does not have hemophilia, so he's a big H and then just simply a Y. Let's go ahead and fill in this Punnett square. Just by convention, we always put the X uh, first and we put the big letter first. So what we see is that of their offspring, they're going to have 75% of their offspring be normal. They will not have hemophilia. One of their offspring will have hemophilia, and notice that it is a male. Start thinking about why we see these sex-linked diseases more in males than in females, and we will talk about it in class. So none of the females have it, and uh, the males, half of them have it. Remember, the dad is always going to give the Y chromosome to the males. So the sons always get the X from the mother. The sons always get the X from the mother. Write that down. I should have written this on, on the actual PowerPoint here. The fathers give the Y to the sons, always. Therefore, the sons get the X's from the mother. So if the mother is a carrier, you know that one son's going to get lucky prob using probability and get the big H, and one son's going to get unlucky and get the little H. Let's do one more together, and then I'll have you do one on your own. So we've got a normal woman and a man who has hemophilia. So a normal woman, she's not a carrier, so she's double big H. But then the man over here, he does have hemophilia, so he's got that little H. So we've got that pennant square filled in. Notice now, because the mother has two big H's, all of the sons are okay because they get their X from the mother. But notice the daughters now. The daughters are all carriers because they get one of their X's from the father, and the father has that little H to donate. But all of their offspring are normal, and they do not have hemophilia. Now let's go ahead and I want you to do this one on your own. Show the Punnett square. Uh, show the genotype and phenotype ratios of the offspring. And then answer these two questions at the end of your notes. Why are sex-linked diseases more common in men than in women? Remember the genotype makeup of men. They've got one X and one Y. And then I want you to do just a little bit of outside research. How are height and skin color inherited? Are they simple Mendelian genetics or are they a non-Mendelian pattern of inheritance?